In this video, we discuss probability. I assume this is your first experience with probability, so we're going to start from the beginning. First of all, there are two types of probability. There is theoretical and experimental. What's the difference? Theoretical probability generally assumes that any of some number of outcomes are equally likely. And to compute it, all you have to do is count up the possible outcomes divide that number into the ones that are favorable to you. So an example would be, you're going to flip a coin once. How many different ways can that come out? Well, it's either heads or it's tails. So there's two uh, possible outcomes. You assume that they're equally likely, and then you say, hey, I really want to see tails. And so there's one favorable outcome, and there's two possible outcomes. So you divide one by two to get one half or 0.5. Experimental probability would be where you run an experiment and then you do not assume that all outcomes are equally likely. And then you just keep good records of how many trials you've made and how many of those trials were favorable to you. So an example of that would be you flip a coin 10 times, you see four tails and that's what you wanted to see. So, if, and that's favorable, so four out of 10 would be the probability, the experimental probability of tails. Now, which one's better? They, they both have their problems and they both have their strengths. So we're gonna do a couple of examples here. Uh, just regarding coin flips, I was on the internet just a minute ago and I was reading somewhere that when you flip a coin, it's if you see heads on the first flip, then there's a 51% chance that the next flip will be heads. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, another site was suggesting that if you, instead of flipping a coin, if you spin the coin, that uh, there's a very high probability, 80% probability that it'll come up tails, and that's because the heavier side of the coin is most likely to uh, fall flat to the table. Who knows if these things are true, but okay, today we want to talk about both types of probability, mostly theoretical. And I have a couple examples, and then we're going to work a bunch of problems from a worksheet that my students are about to be assigned. First example, flip two coins, maybe a dime and a nickel. What's the probability both coins show tails? We're going to do this theoretically. We're not going to flip the coins. We're just going to use our, our brains to figure out, well, what are the possible outcomes? Well, they could both be heads. Heads for the dime, heads for the nickel. They could both be uh, tails. Tails for the dime, tails for the nickel. And then there's actually two other uh, possibilities. It's not just one's heads and one's tails. It's that the dime could be heads and the nickel could be tails, or the dime could be tails and the nickel could be heads. So there's actually four possibilities when you flip two coins. And uh, we want to see both tails. Apparently today we uh, are fascinated with flipping coins and seeing tails. Well, there's only one way that can turn out. So out of the four possibilities, only one of these is favorable to us. So we divide these, we go one divided by four and get either one fourth or 0.25, or you can write this as 25%. That's one example of theoretical probability. Now here's some comments. First of all, as I mentioned, we didn't flip any coins. That's theoretical probability. We didn't do an experiment. The most common error in solving that problem we just solved is that people will say, okay, they're either both heads or they're both tails or one heads and one's tails. And they'll say there's three possible outcomes, especially when they're flipping, oh, say two quarters. And then they'll conclude that getting, you know, both uh, coins having tails, the favorable outcome, they'll say the probability is only one third because they think there's only three possible outcomes, when in fact there's four. Uh, we can use symbols to sometimes abbreviate all this. So for example, if we let TT represent tails and tails, or both coins showing tails, P parentheses TT equals one fourth can represent this entire sentence. The probability of both coins landing on tails is one fourth. So you can see the convenience and the efficiency of learning a little bit of uh, symbolism. Finally, now this is true for um, all probability calculations, whether theoretical or experimental. The smallest probability is zero. The biggest probability calculations will, you know, never come out larger than one. In other words, 
from 0% to 100%, and this number is supposed to tell you the chance of something happening that's favorable to you. In theoretical probability, if some event E is zero, if it has a probability of zero, it's not possible for that thing to happen. Okay? On the other hand, if the probability of your event is one, it's not possible for that thing not to happen. So zero means completely unlikely, and one means definitely going to happen for your event E. Here's a second example. Now, I'm not going to flip coins today because it would make a bunch of noise. But if you did an experiment where you flipped a dime and a nickel, and let's suppose you were in a hurry, so you only did it three times, and you recorded the results of these uh, coin flipping experiments, maybe it would come out something like this. The dime is tails. The nickel is heads on the first experiment. The dime is heads and the nickel is heads on the second experiment. You flip the coins one more time and the dime is heads and the nickel is tails. We want to know, based on these experiments, what's the probability that both coins are tails? Okay, I didn't get both coins landing on tails. I ran three trials. Zero times did I get both coins as tails, which was our... Uh, favorable outcome. So the solution is the probability of tails and tails is zero, because zero divided by three is zero. The second question, what's the probability at least one coin is tails? Well, you can look up here and see this has one tail, this has no tails, this has one tail, and what would also qualify would be if we saw tails and tails for both. But anyway, out of the three trials, two of them had at least one tails. So the probability of at least one tails is two thirds or 0.67 round to the nearest hundredth. That's experimental probability. You can see the problem with this, I think. Um, saying that getting both coins to show tails has zero chance, that sort of defies what I think we know. But according to this experiment, that's the probability we calculated. All right, some comments regarding, this should say example two. I just discussed what's said here, but the idea is maybe just because we only did three trials up here, maybe that's why we concluded that there's no chance of seeing both coins showing tails. Probably if we had the time and the energy to do a thousand trials, we'd get somewhere pretty close to 250 of them being tails and tails. But I don't think we'd be concluding that the probability of tails and tails is zero if we ran a thousand trials. Okay, and I'll comment on this a little bit later, but the, but the notion is sometimes you can calculate a probability by looking at the opposite thing, such as What's the probability that at least one coin is tails? Well, the opposite of at least one coin is tails is that both coins are heads. And the probability of both coins being heads up there turned out to be, you can look at the table, we got to see it once in our experimental uh, probability. There was one double heads out of three trials. So the probability of heads and heads, HH, is one third. Well, if you take that one third and subtract it from one, you get two thirds, which is the probability of at least one coin showing tails. All right, now some homework problems. Um, the numbering here doesn't necessarily correspond to the numbers that my students will have, but most of these problems are very similar, okay? A bag has got four green marbles, numbered one through four, four blue marbles, numbered one through four, and four black marbles, numbered one through four. If just one marble is drawn from the bag, what's the number of possible outcomes in this sample space? Okay, that's the first question. Now you may think, well, it's either green or blue or black, so there's only three possibilities. I can understand that argument, but you have to remember there's 12 marbles in that bag. So... The total number of possible outcomes is actually 12. Now, what's the probability of drawing a green marble? Okay, well, if you did it something like this, you, uh, 
you looked at the green marbles one through four and you labeled them G1, G2, G3, and G4. And then you went to the blue marbles and you gave all those little uh, number labels like B1, B2, where this stands for blue marble number two. So here I am writing out all 12 possible outcomes. And then finally we have, uh, we have green, we have blue, and then we have black. So for black, I'm gonna use L, that's the second letter in the word black. So I have L1, L2, L3, and L4. There are all 12 possible outcomes. And if you're looking for green, if that's favorable to you, the probability of green is four over 12. Because you have four ways of getting what you want out of a possible 12 outcomes, which of course reduces to one third. So, an easy homework problem. They get a little bit harder, but, but not, not terrible. None of these is uh, uh, considered an extremely difficult problem. You flip a coin and draw a marble from a bag containing two yellow marbles. So you're looking at two things here, the result of a coin toss, but also the result of drawing a marble from a bag. What's the number of possible outcomes in a sample space? What's the probability of getting tails on the coin and a yellow marble? Okay, for this, uh, not necessary, but I thought I'd give you experience with something called outcome tree. Yeah, it's got different names too, but here's the idea. We branch out from the beginning here to what are the possibilities for the coin toss? Well, that's either heads or tails. Now, depending on how the coin toss comes out, we then are going to go draw a marble. There are two yellows and one red on that bag. So if we got heads here, we would still have three possibilities. It could be yellow marble number one, yellow marble number two, or yellow marble, or not yellow, no, <laughs> red marble. And we don't need to give that a subscript since there's only one of them. But now, what if the coin toss comes out to be tails? Well, even then, you'd still have the possibility of the first yellow marble or the second yellow marble or the red marble. And so, if you take a look at this, they're starting from the beginning here, you can branch out to six different locations on this tree. There are six possible outcomes. So that's so-called the, the, the sample space. Six outcomes in the sample space. Now the probability of getting tails and a yellow marble, well, that would be either this or this, because you got to come down through, through tails and then you can either go to the first yellow marble or the second yellow marble. So there are two possible ways to get tails and a yellow marble out of six total outcomes. Two sixth equals one third would be my solution to the probability question there. And then for the sample space, six total possible outcomes would be my answer to that question. Okay. Now this problem's kind of hard. There's a game show. It's on five nights a week, Monday through Friday. And every night at the end of the show, uh, they take one contestant, maybe the person who did the best that night, and they bring them up to this table where there's these two hats. Under one of the hats are the keys to a brand new car. Under the other hat, uh, there's nothing. Maybe, you know, some sad trombone music or something. But look, if you're lucky, you pick up the correct hat, you grab the keys, you drive away in a brand new car. All right, what's the number of possible outcomes in this sample space if we're going to play this game one night a week, all week long? On any given night, there's either a win or a loss. Now, I systematically mapped out every single possibility from everybody wins every night, or the one person wins every night, to the one person loses every night and everything in between. And if you have a systematic way of doing this, and I'll explain what my method was, um, you will count up that there's 32 different possible outcomes. Now, there's a much faster way to do that, but for now, here's how I attacked it. I said, everybody wins, followed by everybody wins up to Thursday, there's a loss on Friday. Followed by there's a loss on Thursday and a win on Friday. And then followed by there's win, 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 loss, loss at the end of the week. So what I'm doing here is trying to keep my wins uh, early in the week. 
And, uh, but I'm also trying to exhaust the possibilities every time I put up another loss. So for example, if I put a loss here on Wednesday, I'm keeping my wins on Monday and Tuesday. With a loss here, uh, it could look like, from Wednesday on, it could look like loss, win, win, loss, win, loss. It could look like uh, loss, loss, win, or loss, loss, loss. Anyway, you have to be very organized if you're going to take this approach. But another way you could do it is, you could, it's almost like flipping five different coins. You could say, all right, here's Monday. Here's Tuesday. Here's Wednesday. Here's Thursday. Here's Friday. What are the possibilities on Monday? Well, it's either a win or a loss. Tuesday, same thing. Wednesday, same thing, which is kind of like heads or tails. Thursday, same thing. So on each day, there's two possible outcomes, and they're all uh, independent of each other. And so quite literally, you can go, okay, two possibilities here, times. Two possibilities here, times two possibilities here, times two possibilities. Multiply two times two times two. The total number of possibilities for each night is just two. Multiply all those twos together, and you get two times two times two times two times two, or two to the fifth power is 32. So that counts all the possible outcomes for winning and for losing for one week of playing this game at the end of this game show. Now, we have a question up here. What's the probability only one contestant wins in the week? Well, here's an example of only one uh, where did I find that? Here's an example of only one win, and it's on a Friday. Here's an example of only one win, and it's on a Thursday. Here's an example of only one win, and it's on a Wednesday. Um, here's an example of only one win, and it's on a Tuesday. In other words, if you're only going to have one win, you just have to figure out on what day will you find that win. Will it be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? So... I guess this is favorable that only one contestant wins all week long. Well, there's five different ways that can happen. It can happen on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Friday. So the answer to this was 32. The answer to this is 5 over 32. Now, here's a hard question. What's the probability that exactly two contestants win during one week? Well, you're welcome to go pong through all these to find examples of exactly two wins for example here's one where we have a win only on monday and tuesday um here's one where we have a win only on monday and wednesday here's one where we have a win only on monday and thursday and here's one where we have a win only on monday and friday but all the ones i just mentioned had a win on monday and you can move that around so quite literally, it could go, I'm going to show you all the different ways we can have two winners. They could happen back to back at the beginning of the week. Win, win, loss, loss, loss. Or we could have a win, a loss, a win, and a loss, and a loss. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. A win, and a loss, and a loss, and a win, and a loss. Or a win, a loss, a loss, a loss, and a win on Friday. What do you all four of these have in common? They have a win on Monday. Now what we're going to do is start the week with a loss and move the wins to Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we're going to keep this win here on Tuesday and we're going to cycle this other win on down until Thursday. Like that. Then we're going to move it to Friday but keep this one here. So it'll go loss, win, loss, loss, win. Now that's it for having a win on Tuesday and a win on some other day. Because I already counted a win on Tuesday and a win on Monday back here. So what do we do next? Right, we start the week with two losses and then we go with two wins. And then we have a loss on Friday. We can move this to Friday. That's a new possibility. Loss, loss, win, loss, win. And then there's only one more thing we can do. We could start the week with three losses and end the week with two wins. And so, there they are. All the possibilities of getting two wins, just signed, you know, spreading them out to different days. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten of those. So the answer to that third question is ten over thirty-two, which you can reduce to five sixteenths.
And by the way, there's a there is a faster way to figure out this. This uh, number ten here. How many different ways can we distribute two losses? Well, you got five choices to place the first win: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And once you place it, you only have four choices of where the next win's going to go. Now, five times four is twenty. That's twice as big as what I counted here. So you have to divide by two. Because it turns out that if you just do 5 times 4, you're actually double counting everything. And to explain something like that, look right here. Maybe Bob wins on Monday and Alice wins on Tuesday. Well, that's different than Alice winning on Monday and Bob winning on Tuesday. So this, 5 times 4, we count both of those. But since we don't care who the winners are by name, that's why we have to divide by 2. Okay, that's getting a little sophisticated. Let's keep this moving. Here's a popular problem where you roll two dice. Okay, so we have a white die and a red die, and we roll them both, and we wonder how many different ways can it turn out? Okay, I just copied and pasted an image off my student's worksheet so that you can see there's 36 different ways it can come out. And if you were trying to organize this for yourself, you could say, in this column, the first, the white die always had a one, and the red die toggles from one to two to three to four to five to six. In the second column, the white die has a two every time, and the red die toggles from one to two to three to four to five to six. And as you can see, we end up with um, six rows and six columns, and six times six is 36. All right, let's go through these kind of quickly now. What's the probability that the sum of the numbers on the dice is one? The answer is zero. Because why? Well, the smallest sum you can get is one plus one is two. You can't get something as small as one. What about the probability that it comes out to two? And the answer to this is one out of 36. Because this is the only way to add the two dice up, the numbers on the dice, and get 2. All the rest of these come out bigger than 2. Like, for example, here's 2 plus 1 is 3, here's 1 plus 2 is 3, here's 3 plus 1 is 4, etc. Okay, a harder question. What's the probability of rolling the two dice and then adding the numbers on them and finding out that it equals 3? Yeah, there's only two ways to do that. Right here and right here. So the answer to this is 2 out of 36, or you can reduce it to 1 out of 18. Okay, what about greater than 3? Okay, these two add to 2. These two add to... This one adds to 2, I should say. This combination adds to 3. So does this one. All the rest of these add to 4 or 5 or 6 and so forth. These down here on this diagonal add to 7. All those add up to greater than 3. So really the only ones that don't add up to uh, greater than 3 are these three up here in the corner. So what's 36 minus 3? It's 33. And the probability of getting an answer bigger than 3 is 33 out of 36, which you can reduce those by dividing by 3, and you end up with 11 over 12. Okay, what's the probability that the numbers on the dice add up to 4? You'll usually find the answers you're looking for in a diagonal like this. See, these add up to 4. 3 plus 1, 2 plus 2, and 3 plus 1 adds up to 4. And those are the only possibilities. So it turns out 3 out of 36 or 1 12th. And then finally, what about 12? Yeah, only these two add up to 12. You'd have to get both 6s. So there's a very slim chance of that. Only a 1 in 36 chance. Playing with dice is kind of fun. Here we have a spinner. There are 10 numbers on the spinner. And each one of these numbers is equally likely because each number occupies a, a so-called sector of equal area. Um, assuming that each landing is likely, what's the probability of E where E represents getting an even number? Okay, well, it has to be over 10 because there's 10 possible outcomes. And the number of even numbers is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Looks like, I'll count it again, 4 and 6 and 12 and 18 and 24 and 30 are all even numbers so the answer is 6 out of 10 which is 0. 0.6 or 3 fifths or 60 percent okay there's lots of different ways several different ways you can write this they all mean the same thing what's the probability of 3k where 3k represents uh, a multiple of three okay this is not a multiple of three but six and nine and 12 and 15 and 18 21 24 27 30 are all multiples of three 
So this turns out to be 9 out of 10. It's very, very likely, or a 90% chance, you'd get a multiple of 3. Now, this little tilde or negation symbol means not. So tilde 6k means uh, you're going to land on a number that's not a multiple of 6. What's the probability of finding a number that's not a multiple of 6? Okay, 4 and 9 and 15 and 21 and 27. 4, 9, 15, 21, and 27. Those are the ones that are not multiples of 6. I think I counted 5 of them. So the answer to this is 5 tenths, which is a half, which is 50%. That's a spinner problem. All right, last problem. This is a theoretical problem. It's geometric probability. Think of like a basketball that's in a box that fits perfectly. It touches the bottom, it touches all four sides, and it touches the lid. Now, somewhere in that box, there's a point. What's the probability that that point is inside that sphere? Well, what you're going to do for this is you're going to calculate the volume of the box, which they're calling a cube here, and it's 2 times 2 times 2, because if you read carefully, it tells you all the edges are 2, and that makes 8. Then you're going to calculate the volume of the sphere. And you probably don't know the formula for this, so I'm just going to give it to you. The volume of the sphere is 4 thirds times pi r cubed. Or this is the radius. And what's the radius of that sphere? Well, it's half this edge. So from the center of the sphere out to the any point on the sphere, that radius is 1. And that goes in here. And so since 1 cubed is just 1, for the volume of the sphere, I get 4 pi over 3. And now what you're going to do is divide these two things to figure out the probability that a point that's in the box is also in the sphere. So let's do that. Go away. <laughs> okay, let's do that. That's 4 pi over 3 divided by 8 and it came out to 0.52 which is just a little bit bigger than 0.5 if it were 0.5 exactly we'd say oh it's a 50% chance it's a slightly higher chance though that you'll be in the sphere than let's say that you won't be in the sphere so this point has let's go volume of sphere forgot the P there the volume of the sphere divided by the volume of the cube turn out to be 0.52 to the nearest hundredth which is about a 52 percent chance okay that's it for today hope you enjoy this maybe learn something my name's eric have a good day